well. So um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to make uh, I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to make Jonas and Irina the Irina the presenters. And um, I would say I'd say the the, the floor is um, the floor is yours. Um, you can, as a presenter, Irina, you can you can share your own screen by clicking on top of the. I, I mean, I assume you know this uh, this module, but you have an option for screen share. Yeah, there you are, perfect. Um, and I will also make uh, Jonas uh, a presenter. Uh, if that ah no, okay, so I can only make one person presenter uh, <laughs> at the time. I'm sorry about that. So, uh, but Jonas, you can easily unmute yourself. I think I see you are yeah. unmuted right now, so I think you can just talk. Yeah, that's yes. fine. I, I don't know yeah, also from my side. So just shout if you want to change presenters so that you want to share your screen. And for all others, what I would suggest is that um, you keep yourself muted and that you ask your questions in the chat. I think that will be slightly easier than if we all talk. Uh, but if it becomes too complicated, um, yeah, just unmute yourself and ask your question uh, in talking. Okay, so um, Irena, I'm not sure if you want to say something or Jonas before we start. Yeah, maybe um, we can do a brief introduction. Yeah, yeah, please. Irena, do you yes, want to start? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, so um, as, as you can see in the video, uh, my name is Irena vipaz Pervar and I'm uh, employed in the um, Slovenian Social Science Data Archives. But I'm also leading um, uh, says the training team um, and one of the, the parts um, that we were presenting in the um, online uh, you know recording is a data management guide that was prepared inside CESDA and probably I'll, I'll go through some of these parts later on today so um, some questions might pop up when you see things. Okay, thank yes, you. I, was just, to, yeah. I was just looking for the uh, for the link to the CESTA data management guide and wanted to post that, but I'm going to do that in a second. Yeah, so I'm Jonas. Um, I work in Germany at the GESES data archive for the social sciences. So there's also the, the connection to social sciences, but I'm not myself a social scientist, but have a background in, um, first of all, it was um, literature. And now it's um, on top of that, I have a, a degree in library and information science and at the GESIS data archive, um, I'm responsible on the one hand for, for archive workflows and, and quality assurance there. But um, I have also quite a lot to do with research data management and questions of um, licensing, copyright, etc. So I think that is probably more my area of, of expertise. Um, I'm, I also know a bit about data protection, but I think um, for that topic, um, Irina is probably the more ex, uh, experienced expert. <laughs> yes, um, so thank you. And let me just say that uh, um, actually this area in legal and ethical is uh, developing quite quickly in the last few years and uh, as you probably know there are country specific regulations that we don't uh, know about uh, so clearly so um, some of the things uh, might be about uh, the GDPR in your country um, as it is uh, for Slovenia um, I think uh, that we, uh, at this point, we still don't have a national law, um, so we are waiting for it. Um, yes, okay, so we have a question. Mm. We, we even have three questions. So what I would suggest yeah. is that, okay. we, that we start with these questions in the, um, that, that were submitted through Menti. <clears throat> in the meantime, if you have any, if any of the audience has follow-up questions, uh, just type them in the chat. We're, we're watching that one as well. So the first question is um, the secondary use in the consent form. In case that researchers conduct meta-analysis or empirical review uh, paper which, re which requires the data from other studies, how is it that it could be done? Uh, okay, so this is, I'm not sure if I understand the question. It's, I think it's a, yeah, that's the, it's a licensing question. It's probably one of the more complicated ones. And I think in, in any case that, Irina and I will be answering a lot. Um, it depends. <laughs> so, 
Um, if I understand it correctly, oh wait, it's a question with the consent form. Um, I think it's both, Jonas. You know, so perhaps you can oh, view yeah. it from the licensing, and then we can just say something about consent. Yeah, and maybe maybe yeah. if the person in the chat is is present in the chat, you can also say whether it's it's whether the question has been answered at the end. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I also I, I copied it into the chat, so okay. um, we don't have to switch back and forth. So the I think what what this question refers to is that um, if a researcher conducts research reusing other data and is required then um, to publish his or her data when they publish an article, the question is, you know, how do I deal with the with the rights issue here, because I reuse data from someone else and can I just go and, and republish this data um, because it forms the basis of my own of my own research. So I think that is the that is the question. And it's basically, as I already said, we're a lot of times the answer is um, going to be it depends. So um, first of all, it depends on the, the licenses that was were applied to the original data. So if you do a meta-analysis and, and reuse data from someone else, um, you should have a look at the kind of um, license that is attached to that data. Um, and that license very often is going to tell you what you can or can't do with the data. And if you can, for example, republish it. Um, yes. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, the reasoning also depends uh, what are these uh, data where free of charge, let's say, at the beginning. So if you're using the OEC data, then probably you will not be able to publish the data, but it's really good that you try to deeply record um, linkages. So you can say, I use this and this variable from this and this data, and uh, I you know, calculated something from that. Yeah. So you might be using syntaxes. As it is for the consent form, it's, uh, it goes the same way. So it's basically a link to what was consented uh, on the primary step. So if the consent was given for some sort of research purposes, I would assume that uh, the consent would be then um, the same also for the any kind of uh, secondary analysis. Um, it is, however, uh, best that we do work with some sort uh, anonymous data uh, so you might try to match uh, data together, but not uh, on, on the level of uh, uh, personal identifiers. Um, so this is something that you might think of. Um, but yeah, again, it depends of, um, of uh, also of the topic and the team, whether it's uh, really uh, complicated data, whether it has a lot of personal information that might harm uh, people that are involved. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I think I would like to, you know, reinforce that because as you, so first of all, I think the the original consent form and the, the original consent given that should, that has to, to match with the original license um, applied to the data. So in theory, I think um, if you use the, reuse the data in accordance with the license, I would expect that um, all of all of the questions relating to consent um, are are actually covered um, because the the original researcher would have to apply a license um, that is you know in, in tune with the consent form so if the consent form um, made it clear that the data can be shared and reused by others and this is reflected in the license then I think that there shouldn't be a problem and I also want to reinforce again what Irina said about the um, the syntaxes. So if you can't publish the data somewhere else, um, then I think the way to go about this would be to say, this is the data I used, um, give a reference to where it can be accessed. Um, and then you could, for example, provide the syntax that you use, you know, to harmonize the data and to manipulate it or to, to process it. Um, so everyone looking at your publication could then um, go back uh, him or herself, get the data and do the same um, things that you did with the data to, to, rep, uh, to replicate your results, for example. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe if the, if the person who asked the question is in the chat, you can say um, whether this has answered your question. Uh, and in any case, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to move to the next one. Okay, so it's, this is about data protection impact assessment. What if this, what is the definition of if the risk remains high? Um, so probably I'll not be able to give a strict answer to that uh, because this also depends, you know, on what kind of technology you have at hand and again what kind of data you have and. Uh, but I think it's one of the, the things uh, described now in GDPR that uh, it's, uh, you know, you need to think of kind of reasonable effort uh, in order to re-identify uh, people that are there. Um, uh, again, uh, I think it's not just uh, in the data protection regulation, but it's, uh, it goes back to our ethical uh, kind of standards as researchers that you need to minimize any kind of risk uh, to harm, um, you know, whoever is either your person or organization answering that. Uh, so again, I think uh, a lot of things really uh, depends on uh, the content that you have and what that actually means uh, to a specific um, unit uh, that uh, gave the answer. So I think it's more like, uh, you know, uh, think about it ethically, will I harm that person when I publish it, this data? Um, additional thing that I would like to add is uh, what we see in, in data archiving and what is sometimes f forgotten uh, by researcher is that it's not only the data file that needs to be uh, yeah. properly protected, but it's um, the data file in the combination with other information that you publish that might um, actually reveal uh, something uh, on uh, specific persons or institutions. So be careful about that. It. So it's not only a data file, but it's a whole bunch of documents that you will make public. Uh, so uh, the combination of that needs to, you know, minimize the risk of uh, impact, yeah. Okay, thank you, Irina. Uh, I'll go to the last question that's in the Mentimeter now. Um, so what is the most recommended or common Creative Commons licenses and when, when should data owners register for a license? Yeah, maybe I can start here. Um, oops. Sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> no problem. Um, maybe I'm going to start with the, with the second question. When should data owners register for a license? Actually, to clarify that, you don't have to register for this at all so basically what you do is um so you don't have to apply anywhere for a license or you know say i don't know um enter your details anywhere what you do is you just um publish the license along with your data or your your publication so you can simply in the case of creative commons you just um have a look at the kind of license that you would like to use and then you um you copy the image or, or the text from the Creative Commons page and um, attach that to your data or um, as, a, as a readme or um, you use it in the data repository where you publish that. So there is no, there are no barriers really there to, to getting hold of a license, especially Creative Commons license. Um, as for the second or the first question, which is the most recommended um, license? Um, I do think that Creative Commons is a good tool and that it is, you know, it is very widely used. So Creative Commons licenses um, have the advantage that a lot of people are going to recognize them. They have seen the logos before. They are vaguely, at least vaguely familiar with the, with the different licensing options. I think they are, um, the way they are presented on the, the Creative Commons webpage makes it fairly clear what they can be what the licenses mean. So that's a big plus. Um, in terms of what Creative Commons license you should use, that very strongly depends on um, on your data. It depends on the, um, may depend on the consent form. So, um, so first of all, if, if if there is personal data involved, so data that falls under data protection regulations, obviously you, you can't use an open license because 
it'll be very difficult to, to publish the data in the first place. Um, but for anonymized data, I think my, my personal opinion is um, you should try to make the data as openly available as possible. Um, so the fewer restrictions you put on the use of the data, the, the more widely it can be used. And um, so that could, for example, be a Creative Commons um, attribution license, so CC BY, where basically, you know, um, reusers only have to say where the data came from, or you could um, you could maybe use a CC BY share alike, which means that nobody can take the data and make it um, more, you know, put it in a more restricted um, domain again. But it really depends on what you feel comfortable with and what the data allows you to do. Um, yes, if I can um, second what uh, Jana just said. Uh, so it really depends again on a on the data file that you have and and the consent. And sometimes the data are just uh, so specific, so it cannot be or you would not like it to be commercially used. So you need to add a, a non-commercial license uh, to it. Um, Irregardless of that, um, I would really uh, like to point you to uh, repositories. So uh, most of the repositories has this uh, worked out and they can be of, uh, of much help to you all. So even before you start collecting data, this is one of the things that we would like data management plan to, to be for. Uh, so even before you start collecting, do try to contact your local national repository um, that is also could be uh, you know, uh, specific to the topic and talk this over with them uh, because there are many things that they know and they can um, um, kind of uh, suggest. Um, and also many repositories have their own licenses. So if you decide um, you will deposit at one repository or there are requests from uh, publishing houses, uh, it's good that you check whether you can actually give this data to them under the um, license they, they propose. So it's important that you check this um, soon in advance. Yeah, it's also the, um, the publishing houses are an important point because um, I know, for example, that in the case of um, there is um, a, a journal called Scientific Data, um, that's a nature, nature journal where they, it's basically a data journal and um, so any publications made there about data um, you have to publish the data as well in a repository. And what they, for example, um, require is that the data may not, so the, the data has to be open to commercial use as well. So you, if you want to publish a paper in, in scientific data, publish your data along with it, the data isn't allowed to have a license that excludes commercial use, for example. So sometimes, um, it's good to check what the requirements from, from publishing houses here are as well. Yeah. There was a related question, um, so I just quickly skipped to that one. Uh, so uh, not all data can be copyrightable and you cannot put a, copy, a CC license on, on data that's not copyrightable, right? Only CC0 for clarity? Well, that's it's um it's true that not all data um can be copyrighted um so especially if it it really roughly the um the rule is that the more um work and and um thinking and individuality you put um, into creating the data and processing the data um, the more likely it is that it's um can be copyrighted. But for example, if you just have a, a database that, I don't know, like for um, just t temperature measures um, that something that came right out of a sensor, for example, and you're just, you know, um, taking this, the way that the sensor gave it to you or the measurement instrument gave it to you, then it would probably not be um, copyrighted. The thing is, you could put, you could still put a CC license on it, um, but users would not have to comply with the license. That's 
one thing. Um, you could um, you could put a CC zero license on this um, to make sure that you know. Um, as you as you said that to create clarity because I think that's a very good thing about licenses that you know they they really make transparent what you can or cannot cannot do with the data and they spell it out because I think many users sometimes aren't quite clear what they're allowed to do. And I would also uh, like to to add and Jonas I don't know whether you can uh, confirm this or not but at least my understanding is the CC zero doesn't mean that you don't need to cite somebody. So it actually just means that you can uh, use the data uh, as you want, uh, also uh, embed it in different other tools if you want to manipulate it uh, differently, but you still need to refer to where it was the original. Yeah, I think that there we have to distinguish between the, the legal side, yeah. Yeah. which is that for CC0 you don't have to reference the the creator but if we're talking about good scientific practice and research integrity then i would say you always have to um to reference your sources so in that case you know in a, in a scientific in a research context i would definitely say that even if it's a cc0 then you should still um have a citation of and make clear where it comes from yeah Okay, thank you very much. Let's go. Let's skip to the next question because some some others have come in. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba, this one answered. So this is two questions asked by Garrett in the chat, and I've I've just dropped them in the Mentimeter. Um, when undertaking appraisal analysis of potential data deposits into a repository where researchers refuse to deposit consent forms along with research data, should this result in a decision to uh, to refuse the deposit? So um, currently, we don't have a uh, we have a different view on that in different archives uh, because sometimes uh, um, yeah I mean it again depends on what kind of data you have uh, how uh, important these data sets uh, are for for future but in, in a general rule um, at least the, in in ADP case we want to at least see uh, how the consent was written because currently there's no agreement in repositories so at least uh, not in social science whether archives would need to save consent forms as well uh, because currently it, you know the archives would already uh, get anonymous data in-house so that's kind of the rule this is something that you signed when you signed um, uh, kind of um, license uh, that you, uh, as a researcher, um, you know, said that uh, you the data that you give to the repository are anonymous. Uh, however, again, we still want to see the form, so we see what um, actually researcher promised to a specific um, uh, person involved. Um, but yes, it might be an issue, and sometimes it's just a lot of things in the back that we need to consider. Uh, whether a data set is uh, really important for historical reasons and for some um, um, information we would still save that but put a high embargo on it so uh, it might be you know years time when this data would be released um, or something like that but uh, again it depends on what's there in the back but in general rule some archives that we see and under CESA umbrella do uh, now um, imply that you need to deposit consent forms along uh, the research data. So yeah, sometimes you just don't have it because you originally say um, uh, I want to have this data anonymous so people would just not put any kind of personal information inside the data at the time uh, where the collection is made. So uh, it's a lot of things that you need to reconsider, you know, how the information letter was written, what's written in the consent if it is there, and what kind of uh, data or so variables that you have in a data set. Yeah, so at, at the GSS Data Archive, we also do not, we don't want the consent forms, to be honest, because in, in the worst case, the, we get anonymized data and then the consent forms aren't anonymous because yeah. maybe the, the name is on there or something. And so what we also would do is we would have to look at a, at a sample, consent, sample consent form to see how the consent was phrased and if it in fact allows for um, deposit of the data in a, in a repository. But 
we would argue that it's the responsibility of the researcher to um, to deal with the with the consent forms. And I mean, with data protection, that's that's really a, a big issue because as soon as the the consent form contains personal data. I think the, the researcher would also be obliged to delete that at some point when, when they don't need that anymore, um, which makes it really difficult to, um, to de you know, when, when someone does come back and have questions about, you know, how was consent um, achieved and I mean, then it could be really important just to have the forms, but I mean, that's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult field really. Yeah, I think this, this will probably, um you know, be more obvious in, in following years, but currently we all have these questions of who need to save this and, and, and where uh, do they need to save it and what happens if researcher moves from one organization to another, so it's primary organization or, or researcher's responsibility. So a lot of questions are there in the back and I think this is not really agreed yet. So it will, it will be on the table for probably next years. Yes. Okay. So. Thank you. And I think that answers the follow up question that Garrett asked as well, whether the data and the consent form should be held together in one location, uh, unless you've got anything else to add to that. Uh, yeah, so I just think that, yes, uh, in, in a level, if you want to protect, um, you know, um, people that gave you consent or organization, please do keep them separately. Okay. So no, this has been answered. And then uh, a question by Chris sir, is, uh, does one has to consider future technologies for the anonymization of data when publishing sensitive data? So, yes, on, on one hand, um, I think, uh, again, uh, what is stated in the GDPR, um, um, I think that uh, uh, researchers or even archives will need to um, check uh, this data file uh, on, on some basis. So perhaps once or, or, or you know once per year, once per two years, uh, whether uh, current technologies or future technologies at the time will actually uh, be able to de-anonymize the data. But uh, um, at the time that, that you publish and put the data in the uh, hands of others, uh, I think it's a bit hard for you to to maintain this. So um, this is also one of the things that uh, why I would propose that you publish the data through trusted repositories that uh, at least by my understanding we will need to take care of this also in the future. Yeah, I think to that it's I think for individual researchers this is a really hard one so I would also I would agree with Arena that you know depositing the data in a in a repository that has discipline specific expertise. So in in this case, I, when when sensitive data is, I mean, sensitive data will not go into um, a, a general repository like Zenodo anyway. So it will have to be protected. But I think that we as data archives and data repositories, we have to um, to monitor the situation. I think we will have to, you know from time to time reassess, you know, is this data still, can this still be considered anonymous or um, has something changed in the situation? And then we as archives would have to take action there. Um, ideally, of course, together with the data depositors and data producers. So if we still have um, contact information for, for them, we would probably discuss with them, you know, how to, how to deal with potential problems, but, um, it is something that, yeah, that this is evolving and it, it will just something that will keep us busy um, probably from now on in, into yeah. the future. Okay, thank you. So for now, there are no more questions anymore in the Mentimeter. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question uh, to Jonas and Irena? Uh, right now. Uh, if so, maybe I suggest you just unmute yourself. It might be quicker. Mm -hmm. We need some background music. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very good news. It means that you've been very clear and uh, and I think it was uh, it's this was very enlightening. Um, 
I don't know, uh, Irena or Jonas, is there anything else that you want to share with the audience here uh, or that you are any any additions to what's been said now during this uh, this uh, Q&A session or during the, uh, in the tutorial or, or with any of the learning materials that have been shared? So perhaps I would just like to again expose that there are so many different chapters in uh, uh, DM Guide that was written by SESDA archives and uh, anyone that's interesting either in this topic or the topics that cover a whole research data life cycle can go there uh, and browse it. It's uh, a work of, of a year of a whole team of SESA experts including Jonas. Uh, so a um, lot of information there and uh, it's um, we are trying to update it uh, you know every year so our information will be there. And also there are several um, local workshops organized again by your national representative archives. So you might go and check their web pages and see if they're offering something uh, in this relation to the data management and uh, or perhaps even ask them to, to organize something. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I have anything to add. Um, I, as Irina said, I also worked on the on the SESTA data management guide, and I really think it's a it's a really good resource. Um, even though that's you know praising ourselves, but I think it's it's very comprehensive. And um, even I think that even if you're not from the social sciences, I think some of the chapters on on the legal um, questions on the licensing data sharing, they are. Also can also be relevant to you if you're not from the social sciences, um, and there is contact information. So if you have questions about anything, um, you could get in touch with us or the group. And um, I think that even if you're from a from a different um, discipline and not from the social sciences, um, we I mean we're quite well connected to other. Um, other archives, so I think that we could also probably be of help in, you know, identifying someone else from your discipline who could be helpful here. Yes, thank you, thank you. And this, I think that's actually a very useful, uh, a very useful remark in general. That is that sometimes we do, um, you know, like sometimes the trainings or webinars or tutorials might seem targeted toward one one or one specific discipline, but that does not mean that, that there cannot be given any advice that is either more general or, or very specific for another discipline. So if ever you have any questions and, and the expert is in another field than yours, just don't hesitate to, to reach out in any case, because a lot of the principles are very similar, aren't they? So, um, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Can I yep. ask one question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's it's Libby from Gisus. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is maybe not a fair question, and, and to be honest, I think it's one I should also know the answer to. But I'm interested in in your views. Uh, I know, you know, I, I completely agree. Uh, even though it is um, tooting our own horn a little bit, I do think that the SESTA guide is is really a good overview. I'm wondering though, for for researchers who are you know, one step beyond that, that is they're reasonably, I'm sorry, and I'm referring particularly to questions about GDPR implementation. Mm -hmm. So for researchers who are kind of know, know the basics or for people who are are teaching researchers and want to, to give them one, one level beyond, but essentially don't want to send them to read, you know, all 89 articles, is there a particularly good interim resource on GDPR in particular that you think is well suited to researchers? Um, so as you probably know, uh, Scott published something um, in August. So uh, this is kind of a combined source for that. Right, do you mean the FAQ? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, those that are there, uh, but, uh, but no. Actually, uh, you know, I, I was looking at uh, different web pages of different institutions uh, and how to go about it. Uh, but it's also what's um, important, and we don't have it uh, so detailedly here in the guide. Is uh, again that these are there are national legislations, so it's not only a data protection uh, that are uh, in a country specific. But in Slovenia, for example, we have also other laws that are related to that. Uh, right. especially research laws. Um, so it's it's really a lot of different combination of things that a person 
really need to 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 know and, and yes as i said i know that you're dealing with that a lot and uh, um I think at, at one point we'll uh, yeah we'll need to sit down again and, and try to figure out. But I didn't really find a good uh, um, you know other examples that I, I would suggest that would be specific for research. You know, so they they exactly. they exactly. yeah. So you can find a lot of things that are explaining um, um, all the articles and chapters that are in recitals that are in GDPR and uh uh yes and let me just try to f find it so i think and i'll put it in a chat um so and i don't because i don't know where i have it uh, uh also in 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 the slides so this is one of the links that i found recently that has a uh, uh, whole chapters uh there oh. and uh, when you click it you also you see the issue that you need to see then direct your gdpr also the impact that will actually have for your organization or what you need to do so uh, i found it this really kind of interesting so there are like pluses and and you know minuses and things like that in there um, but again uh, this uh, again links uh, to the whole uh, gdpr and it's not only the uh, things that are related to the researchers okay but good good to know thanks very much and uh, Moitz, I see your your question. Uh, I actually downloaded a file from from Scott, and I'll uh, try to find it. And uh, it will be probably in in a minute or something uh, here of this uh, meeting as well. Ah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I was just browsing. Um... German organizations web page because they have um, a publication also on data protection and research, but um, it's only available in German, so there is no yeah there's no English translation. Okay. But even even yeah, um, Jonas, if you have that, you can link it because we might get researchers that are can read it. Yeah. I will yeah. um, post it in the chat as well. So let me see. So Scott's post is on the Academia, and I think most of you can, can access this. So you just need to register. You might already have the account. So I also added a link to the Scott's, Scott's document. Uh, so it's general data protection regulation, researcher, and archiving uh, questions. Uh, I think that uh, it was, let me see, published, yeah, July 2018. And um, yeah, Scott is doing a lot with these questions in the UK. Okay. In any case, um, maybe uh, Irina and Jonas, if you think of any other resources that might be useful, you can just send them to me as well and I can add them to the general um, to the general information page about this webinar series. Mm -hmm. uh, just like we did yeah. with the links. Um, yeah, is there any, yeah. yep. are, are there any other questions? Okay. Perhaps okay. I, would, I would just like to mention, and sometimes it, this is not clear, but many of the archives uh, already UK um, data service and also the ICPSR have the wording uh, related uh, that uh, to the future use of uh, data files uh, that you should add in, either in the information sheet or the uh, consent form. Uh, so you can find uh, some links in my presentation already, but do try to go online because there are many things already there really and it's uh, not worth of you know uh, kind of using too much time for your own to figure it out how it should be worded okay in that case i think i will um i will close the session right here um and, and i would really really like to thank you irena and, and jonas for uh being present here and for uh answering the questions and uh, also I would like to uh, thank the, the people in the audience who asked their questions because I think it was very interesting and this was a very uh, very interesting conversation um, 
like I said, we're going to record this um, and we will distribute recordings uh, somewhere, I think, next week. It will depend a bit um, because there's it's a holiday um, here. So uh, but you will receive in any case one follow up mail with all the final uh, with all the final information and recordings and presentations and things like that. Um, well, if nobody has anything uh, more to add, I would uh, I would suggest that I close this session now. And um, again, uh, Irena, Jonas, thank you very much. Yeah, thank um, you for the invitation. <laughs> no, it was uh, yeah. very interesting. Thank you. And yeah. talk to okay. You. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.